Welcome to the first February edition of Red Meat. I'm Jim Garrity along with Mark Hemingway. February, the month of Valentine's Day, the holiday of love. But I don't know about you, Mark, I have no love for Tom Daschle. Uh, <laughs> I've always been a little bit of a, I, I always respected the guy for the way he handled the anthrax issue in his office. Knew some folks involved with that and couldn't really bring the bile. Couldn't really bring the absolute loathing uh, that, you know, ordinarily you can bring to leaders of the opposition. But I really kind of think of this latest tax issue in which he just kind of happened to not report a car and driver that a company was providing to him. Uh, ended up having to pay $146,000 in back taxes over this. Um, is Tom Daschle now kind of... Sorry, it, this, this should put the nomination in jeopardy, and yet it's yet not like clear. I guess everybody's keeping their powder dry, correct? Well, I think everyone's keeping their powder dry, but that's just because Congress is so clubby about this, 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 these kinds of things, especially in the Senate, where you know, a lot of these people work with Tom Daschle, and it's just, it's just a rule of thumb. You know, even, even, even people in other parties, you, you just don't immediately go out there swinging against someone that is you know, a member of the club, uh, and that is a, an unfortunate reality. Um, that said, I mean, I mean, even liberal bloggers are coming out and saying, all right, you know, <laughs> we 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 Geithner. tolerated Geithner, but but this might be a bridge too far. It's like Geithner used the last get out of jail free card, and, and you kind of realize. I just have this feeling that you know this this cycle goes through. None of Obama's, if nobody lays a glove on any of Obama's nominees, that eight years from now or sixteen years from now, we'll be saying, yes, he did murder those two people with an axe, but he served the state for a long time, and I worked with him in the Senate, and he was always a fine fellow. So. We know that in his heart he's a good person. You know, I mean, where do you, at what yeah. point do you say, all right, not, you, know, you didn't pay your taxes for X amount of years, I can't approve you for this, you know, for this cabinet position? Well, I think, I think, one, you have to look at the sort of the nature of the scandal. With Geithner, it was, okay, here's a guy that was making $150,000 a year that uh, claimed a deduction that he, he, he wasn't really entitled to and uh, you know, screwed up filing self-employment taxes. That, that's difficult, um, you know, even for the head of the IRS. You know, there, there's a... I'm not sure I agree with that, given the circumstances of the guy from the nomination, but there's a case to be made for that. Now, is the average voter really going to look at Tom Daschle and say, well, of course, the million-dollar lobbyist forgot to report his you know, car and driver. I mean, that is not a situation where anyone uh, can, can relate to. Mark, if I had a dime for every time I forgot to report the car and driver that uh, someone provided for me, I'd be broke. That never happens to anyone. But anyway. Well, but the other thing here is, in the, and people need to look at, seriously, what's going on here. I mean, it, it, this isn't just about tax evasion here. This is about the culture of Washington. I mean, the very idea that he was being provided with a car and driver by a wealthy, longtime Democratic donor is, is kind of insane. And, and, but more than that, though, it speaks to the culture of Washington. Uh, Dashiell, you know, was getting paid a million dollar a year salary from a... Uh, um, from, from a, a lobbying firm, not to do lobbying. Yeah, just uh, to you know, just but, to advise and, the lobbyists. And the previous position that uh, um, that that Dashiell had was was previously held by by Bob Kerry, and to be bipartisan about this, Slade Gorton from. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, you know, this is clearly a, 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 an example of a lo of a very powerful lobbyist lobbying firm trading on the influence of these former politicians. And uh, you know, this is what you know Barack Obama came out and said was wrong with Washington. What John McCain said was wrong with Washington. And people keep saying these things, and yet you know the world turns. Mm -hmm. um, well, speaking of things that Obama and McCain had said was wrong with Washington, extradition uh, and rendition was was another yeah. uh, issue. But apparently, that's okay under certain circumstances. You had in the corner a, a very good post pointing out. Human Rights Watch of all groups was kind of changing their tune. Is that a yeah? Term? There were the L.A. Times story reporting that Obama um, was in fact not stopping rendition and may even be expanding the practice. Um, um, there was a quote buried in there that, that a liberal blogger very you know picked up on, and they immediately did a search from, from Human Rights Watch saying, you know, we've been talking to the Obama administration and we, we think that rendition might be okay in limited circumstances. Well, if you go back, I mean, just last year to reading what Human Rights Watch was writing about. Um, extraordinary rendition, uh, it, it, it's mind-blowing. Um, I mean, this is just an unbelievable flip-flop. And, and the thing about this that gets me is people obviously disagree about how extraordinary the measures we need to take to protect this country right now uh, against terrorism. I understand that. And frankly, I think in a civil society such as ours where we zealously guard our rights, whether you agree with rendition or not, that there would be an element of society that would push back against that is extraordinarily healthy and, and something that, that we, can also, we can all take heart in that the people that have been most well known for, for pushing back against this and doing so in a way that everyone thought was principled 
and in a way that I think you know a lot of people can laud from across the political spectrum. Michael Ledeen, uh, National yeah. Review, this morning wrote that he he he's been appalled by rendition all along and has said so. Um, so you know the the fact that these people are completely unprincipled about this when it comes to supporting Obama uh, mm -hmm. is is just frankly appalling. Well, I just want to is it perhaps that they're okay with it because under Obama it's going to be ordinary rendition? Um, or, or is it just going to become maybe extra special? You know, is this simply a cosmetic change that makes it okay? Or is it there really going to be something genuinely different that, well, I mean, apparently it's going to be only to non-torturing countries, which raises the question, why would you need to rendition Why would you, yeah, exactly. Then, then why not just, uh, um, you know, why not just uh, um, put them before the court in the United States? Uh, apparently, it's, uh, I guess the like, questions, interrogations are much tougher when they come with a Canadian accent. <laughs> Where's the bomb A? You know, uh, and, and, and it's and it's clear from the quote in the story that uh, um, you know that, that you know that there's no hard and fast rules here. The Obama administration hasn't figured out exactly what they're doing in the rendition in the first two weeks. I mean, this is not something that is is nailed down, and they're already rolling over. So you know, I suppose it's possible the Obama administration is going to come up with something that seems more humane. Although I, I think if you take a principled uh, um, stand on the, the issue of rendition. Uh, I don't see how you're okay with plucking someone from the country that they, they live in and taking them to another country against their permission. I mean, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Pledging that you're not going to do it would kind of infer that you wouldn't do it. Uh, yeah. Speak, but anyway, we'll close on a little bit of good news. A little bit, or at least I, I thought it was good news. I, yeah, I covered it Friday. Uh, Michael Steele is now the new chairman of the Republican National Committee. I am wearing the pinstripes in honor of him. Uh, I couldn't get the four button, but, uh, you know, I was reason I, I didn't have a true dog in this race. I, I really uh, didn't uh, think that there was a. I saw strengths and weaknesses to each one of them. But look, Michael Steele, at the light, upside, you're getting a, a tremendously charismatic, a, a tremendously energetic, um, a guy who really overperformed all things considered in yeah. the Maryland Senate race not too long ago. Um, there is no place he won't take the Republican message, and yeah. you know, with passion and all that stuff. We used to having Mike Duncan, uh, who's been the chairman for the last two years, and who I think. Um, I don't know if it's fair to compare him to a lump of mashed potatoes, but, but really kind of not exactly zesty and exciting. I've been cooking a lot lately, so you have to prove the, the yeah. culinary metaphors. Um, that, that I, I kind of see a lot of potential with steel and getting you know, conservative messages out, getting Republican messages out that you just weren't going to get in the last two years. No, I mean, I think there's anything we can say that, that is wrong with the Republican Party right now. There's a dearth of good communicators, mm -hmm. and, and, and nobody's ever said that Michael Steele isn't an excellent communicator. Yeah. But, but more than that, though, just sort of who uh, Michael Steele is, you know, um, you know, a lot of people complained about this, and, and, and I, you know, I have my own reservations on this, but on the whole, you know, the fact he's more moderate, uh, um, you know, I mean, you know, the, you know this, I certainly don't think that he, he won the race just because he's African-American, but, you know, you know, let's be honest here, it helps. Uh, um, you when, know, so what, the medium kind of is the message there as well, and, 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 I, and it sets a good tone going forward. Yeah, I was going to say, the other thing to note is that, you know, it, it was a very interesting process to watch on Friday. They have several rounds of voting, but nobody ever has to drop out. Yeah. Uh, ironically, Duncan was the first one to drop out yeah. um, in, after the third one. It came down to Caton Dawson, chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party, um, who had a, a lingering controversy over membership in yeah. a country club that had an all-white charter. Now, did some reporting on this. The country club was not all-white. They had African-American guests. He never bothered to look into the charter. Yeah. Um, to me, I can understand that, that, you know, that not being aware of it, some people don't accept the excuse, some people that's, you know, that's a defining issue. People knew going to that final vote that if he had beaten Michael Steele, yeah. The headline was going to be, guy who was in an all-white country club yep. beats African-American to become the next RNC chairman. So, you know, there's, there's a certain, um, race was a factor, but I think it was just an awareness of, you know, that Caton Dawson, fairly or unfairly, was going to send a really tough message. Well, the, but the, the bottom line here is, is that, of, you know, of all the candidates, there were a lot of candidates and good candidates like Dawson, I think that, you know, not just with the, the, the problems of the country club, but they would have been perceived as uh, a choice that played toward the base. Yeah. And I think there's a growing awareness in the Republican Party that playing to the base is not what we need to do right now. I and mean, we need to expand, you know, into a, you know, governing coalition and a majority. And Michael Steele is a, is a good step forward to yeah. doing that. Uh, not to understate him, Steele also appealed to voters who like to use the word baby. Uh, he is the guy who invented drill, baby, drill. And uh. during his acceptance speech, baby was every other third. So. If you've wanted an RNC chairman who sounds a lot like Austin Powers, Michael Steele is your guy. That wraps up this edition of Red Meat. I'm Jim Garrity, along with Mark Hemingway. Thank you for tuning in to NRO's The Corner. See you around.